Ready for our YouTube debut. Yes, sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 114 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Cauley. As always, I'm joined by Bryson and Jacob, and it's been a pretty crazy week, pretty crazy past few days for the Blue Jays, but they're here. We're talking about a win. That's all that matters. We are. Uh, I'm doing good. It's been a interesting week of ups and downs with this team. Um, unfortunately, there was nothing today on Sunday, April 11th. We were supposed to record after the game, but unfortunately, rain got in the way of that. So the Blue Jays end up taking one out of three, and uh, there's going to be a makeup down in August. Yeah, and it was a late game yesterday as well, of course, with the rain delay. Nearly three hours. Ended at 1.06 a.m., the latest end time third latest end time of a Blue Jay game in history. So crazy set of games over the weekend, but how are you, Jacob? I'm doing fantastic. I'm very excited. You know, this has been, it's been a weird week for the Blue Jays, but you know, any Blue Jays baseball is fun. And I have a weird prediction that mother nature saw the Blue Jays end at 1am and said, you know what, we're going to give them the day off. I think they're a little bit tired because those announcers, the crew chief, they were, they were at it well into the night and I was exhausted by the end of it, but it's been a fun week. Yeah, the funniest thing I thought I saw was from Jamie Campbell, I think it was, and he said, if the Angels are staying at the hotel I think they're staying at, they have a long drive ahead of them. And I can't just imagine how, you know, game ending 106, you get right out of there, you still have to drive however long it is to the hotel, and then be back at the ballpark in the morning for a one o'clock game, only for it to be rained out. Like, it's better that it's rained out than they played it. But anyways, crazy game. But let's start by talking about the game yesterday, because obviously that's the freshest game on our mind. That's what everyone's talking about right now. And 15 runs for the Blue Jays after offensive woes that continued throughout the week. You know, they did take that series against the Yankees, as we talked about last week, but they didn't have offense going in that series. Series against the Rangers, no offense going. And then the first game um, of this four-game set and the second game of this four-game set against the Angels, no offense going. They finally kick-started things. Josh Palacios taking a lot of headlines. Bo Bichette taking a lot of headlines. Um, it was a good day at the ballpark, even if it started a lot later than expected. Does it put your worries about this offense to bed? Are you still worried about what this offense can do? I'm worried until it's consistent because let's be real here. This was not a very good week for the Blue Jays, even dating back to Sunday, that game where they had high Jin Ryu on the mound, seven strong innings. He was fantastic. And they lost the game two to one. So it's definitely not been a very good offensive week minus the one game against the, or the first game in the, in the Angels series, but definitely been very scary for me. Uh, I do think that this needs to, to be very consistent and we're not sure when the next game is going to be, or I, I believe it is, tomorrow actually against the Yankees. So we'll see what that's about. Uh, if they're able to consistently perform that way, then I think maybe our, our worries were a little bit overreactive, but I think right now it's a little bit early and we really do need to see is what we've seen in this angel series for real. And also when are these guys that are on the, now the COVID IL, when are they going to get back? Because there are a lot of, I think, uncertainties about what's going to necessarily happen with this team. Yeah, there uh, a lot to unpack uh, this entire week. So we recorded last Sunday, uh, and then of course the Texas series did happen as well that we uh, forgot about. Uh, the Jays took the first one, then of course uh, a couple of disappointing games uh, for the to end the series. And right away, I think that's when uh, the panic button from certain fans uh, in terms of the offense started to hit in. And then of course uh, the weekend series against the Angels opens up. Supposed to be a four game series, ends up being three due to rain. And it didn't go too well the first two games. So we've been seeing a consistent thing uh, this week. And the offense has been struggling, you know, as a team, as a whole, these last seven days, the team has only hit, has an average of 230 and an OPS of 686. So obviously not the greatest numbers. Uh, however, the pitching has been all right, despite the diesel truck. Uh, you know, we, we're going to talk about him in a little bit. But other than Dan O'Rourke's start, uh, you know, the pitching has been all right. And uh, I think uh, I'm not the only one that is saying that you know we have Hunjin Ryu who's been doing good doing his job as per usual and of course Steven Matz is someone who's impressed someone else that we will be talking about uh later on so the concern is not the pitching the concern is the offense now from my standpoint I was never hitting the panic button or concerned with this team because I'll tell you why 
first of all, this team is traditionally slow in April, going back to years past. And even last year in the shortened 60 game season, we saw the same thing. This team was hovering about around 500, sitting below 500 by a couple of games. And of course, near the final month and a half of the season, which was in this case last year, like the second half of the season, uh, they made a late surge. And I'm seeing, we, we are seeing the exact same thing uh, this year. Of course, there's been a few breakout stars already. We've been talking about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. We still are talking about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Uh, he hasn't slowed down one bit. He's been getting better and better since we last recorded. His OPS is now at 1,159. And the one thing about him, too, is the one thing that we haven't seen from him before is how comfortable he does look at the plate. Uh, he's got eight walks as well, leading the team in walks. And that's the one thing where is one of my biggest highlights because we know the power is there. We know the contact is there. But the patience he's had this year so far and the walks he's been taking is really fulfilling himself as a complete player. Because last year, there were so many pitches where you can watch a game so far this year and say, last year, 2019, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is swinging at that. Regardless if it's down and away, inside, high, low, no, no matter what, anywhere outside the strike zone, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would likely swing at that prior to 2021. And we're seeing a completely different Vladdy so far. Uh, I know people are a little bit upset with Bo Bichette. Uh, his numbers were pretty low. And of course, yesterday's abomination, which was on Saturday, where they put up 15 runs, that obviously changed things. So Bo Bichette's numbers are back on the rise. And of course, defensively, there's been a little bit of a concern. But overall, with this team in the offense, I, you know, I, I don't understand the concern. I understand people are, you know, anxious and they want to see all this come together. But we are we're a weekend. We've only played, I think it's, you know, there's barely, it's not even 10 games yet. And I still think this team needs to relax and there's so much time for this team to get going. And, you know, you, like I said, you've seen this traditionally from this team, a slow April, which is why I'm not concerned whatsoever. Yeah. You know, just because I'm not concerned, that doesn't mean I'm not frustrated for sure. Lots of frustrating games, uh, despite Saturday's game, pretty much every game prior to Saturday's game, it was frustrating and disappointing. So that's why I'm not concerned. And I still have faith for this offense as well. We still haven't seen the full offense come together. We're still waiting on George Springer. And of course, Teoscar Hernandez, somebody who's going to be sidelined for at least a week. Now he's on the COVID IL and he's got to go through mandatory quarantine. And the team is now dealing with some side effects from the vaccine. So, you know, that can happen at any time where they can come back. We've seen Ryan Barucki was on the list for just one day. Lord Escurio Jr. is on the list as well. So hopefully he's back for tomorrow night, which is Monday. There's a chance. And, um, you know, I'm not concerned whatsoever. So a lot of highlights still from some individual players. And obviously the team together has to get going. There's some players who are still, you know, haven't recorded a hit or, you know, struggling, you know, names that come to mind are Danny Jansen, uh, Danny Jansen and um, lots of other players like Kevin Bijou had a little bit of a slow start. We Rowdy talked about him last week. Rowdy Telez is another one. And uh, we spoke. We, yeah, we spoke about Bijou last week. And uh, clearly we were a little bit over the top with that one, I think. But Rowdy Telez is another one who comes to mind. So not concerned whatsoever. And, um, you know, just hold patience because we we saw it on Saturday. And it's something that I think we'll be seeing eventually as well as this team starts to get healthy. Can I just say, Why? I want to go back to that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. comment. His on-base percentage this year, now 29 at-bats out of a couple hundred, is 538. So take this in. He has gotten on-base more times than he has not gotten on-base, whether it be a hit or a walk or anything. So th this guy, I think, is for real. This is the year of Vladdy, and he's taking so many pitches and taking a lot of walks, too, a couple, especially in the Angels and the, the Rangers series. This is not a guy that's that looks clueless at the plate. He knows what he's doing. And he has a plan. And I think he is definitely early on again, but he is definitely the guy that I am really looking on and, and saying, Hey, this guy might be actually for real. He might be the player that we've been just anxiously waiting for. Mm -hmm. And obviously his numbers, like they are going to dip and his batting average on balls and plays so far this season is kind of outlandishly high. I don't have the numbers in front of me. So of course we can't expect this over a full year. We can't expect this production to continue, but it's still going to be, I, I think none of us would be surprised if it's still at an elite level at a level that I guess we kind of expected when he first came up in 2019. So that's really encouraging. And Bryson, you mentioned one word, patience, that I think is really important that we saw in yesterday's game from the Blue Jays. In addition to, it's really important that fans show patience with this team. In terms of the players, I think we saw, I mean, we talked about it last week with Kevin Biggio, but the players seem to be taking a more aggressive approach than they have in the past. 
We saw Kevin Bijou. You know, we knew he was going to be trying to swing more at first pitch strikes, but I think he kind of took it overboard a bit. He went too far and was striking out. He kind of broke out of his strong plate discipline and was not doing well. But as the week progressed, and especially on Saturday, you know, we saw the Blue Jays walk an outlandish number of times. And I think that's because they were showing patience. They were taking more pitches, working counts, working pitchers. And that's what the Blue Jays need to do. And I just think it takes time to get there, right? It's starting the season. You're hearing all about these aggressive plate approaches and they're getting excited. And, you know, the Blue Jays are still the youngest team in baseball. So it takes time to get there and the hits are going to come. The walks are going to come. The production is going to come. It just takes patience on the side of the players and the fans to realize it takes time. Now, of course, there are still a few names, even with the breakout performance yesterday, that are carrying the Blue Jays, like we've mentioned. Randall Grishik is one of them. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is another name. And there's still names who are really disappointing. You know, even someone like Marcus Simeon, who by and large has been good this season, he still isn't great. You know, his OPS plus is 99. So he's still a tiny bit, little bit below average. Danny Jansen, of course, horrible. His OPS plus is one um, right now. You have guys like Kevin Biggio, a little bit, under what the expectations are. Lourdes Gurriel Jr., um, he's not doing anywhere near as close to what we would expect from him. He's batting 192 compared to what it was 306 last season. Um, Teoscar Hernandez, he has an OPS plus of 44. Rowdy Telez, of course, not even going to mention him, still doesn't have a hit this season, has only been on base once with a walk. So he has an on-base percentage of um, 0.087. So, of course, disappointing names up and down the lineup. But I think it's only a matter of time before we see them come out and and become the players they were last season. Some people are concerned and kind of panicking, and I think this is where most of the panic comes from, but that the fact that um, these players aren't who they were last season, you know, 60 games, we've got a good sample of them. They Most of them are new to the majors. Pitchers hadn't figured them out yet. I think a lot of people thought, you know, prior to yesterday's game, prior to people realizing, okay, maybe we were overreacting a bit. People thought that, you know, they're, they're only doing bad because that's who they are. Pitchers have figured them out. They need to fix something. They're not going to be able to perform in the major league levels. Our expectations are too high. I don't think that's true. I think Roddy Telez is going to back, 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 bounce back. I think Marcus Simeon is going to bounce back. I think all these guys are going to bounce back to what they were last season, or at least close to what they were last season. Just takes time. So yes, in short, patience is a word we need to keep in mind with these Blue Jays, but Still very fun to watch yesterday. And even when they're losing, it's frustrating, but it's fun to watch the Blue Jays. Yeah. The the question I have for you guys is, you know, Rowdy Tillez in particular, just because, you know, other than 2020, we haven't seen what we've been hoping for from Rowdy Tillez. I guess what I'm trying to say is the 2020 Rowdy Tillez, we haven't seen in a full season. And in 2019, Rowdy Tillez was somebody who struggled at the major league level. He had to do a Buffalo or a triple A stint with Buffalo at times. And of course, Rowdy Telez uh, put up a, a lot of good numbers last year. So, you know, what are you guys expecting from Rowdy Telez? I know obviously anything better than what we're seeing now, but are you expecting some sort of version, maybe a little bit less than 2020, or are you expecting more? Like, what, like, what do you think about Rowdy Telez right now? Yeah, I'm not expecting him to be what he was in 2020. And I think like even a guy like Lourdes Goriel Jr., right? I, I'm not expecting him to hit over 300 again over a full season. I think that's only because, you know, the Blue Jays were lucky to get away with what they had in a small sample size. They had good performances from these guys, but I don't think we should expect Rowdy Telez to be a, you know, a 346 on base player as he was in 2020. I don't think we should expect him to carry, you know, I don't know, 25 home runs. I guess he was on pace for last season. If it was over 162, I don't think we should expect that over a full season, but I don't think, you know, we're going to go to these guys being like, double A or triple A quality players. I still think they're going to be quality players at the major league level. Plus you toss in guys like George Springer, Marcus Simeon, the acquisitions the Blue Jays got over the off season. Like I, I think they're going to be really, really good at the plate still. Yes. Maybe they're going to depreciate a little bit, go back to what they were more on average back in kind of, like you said, 2019 type players, but I, I don't think we should expect them, expect them to be as bad as they have been to start the season. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right there. I mean, obviously, one thing I'm going to point out is I feel like 2020 was almost the year of exaggerations when it comes to player stats, because 
as we saw with the Blue Jays, you know, one six game winning streak was the equivalent of, I think it was a 16 game winning streak. So if you get hot for a month or a couple of weeks, that can drastically influence your stats for the entire season. So with Rowdy Telez, I think people need to realize that we shouldn't expect a 283 hitter, somebody that was, I believe before he got injured in September, he was hitting 550 at a time or like right before that injury occurred. So he was hitting extremely well. Do I think that that was sustainable over a full season or even a full 60 game season? Probably not. So I'm going to say he will regress a little bit. I mean, previously in 2018, in 73 plate appearances, he had a 314 on base percentage, but he was new to the league. So we didn't really know too much about him. But then in the next in the next year, in 2019, 409 plate appearances, uh, 370 of those were actual at bats, a 227 hitter. So probably somewhere around that, maybe 250-ish, 260, you know, maybe 240 to 260 is probably your range for Rowdy Telez. Uh, I do think realistically, is he going to get a hit this season? Yes. Like, w- let's answer that right there. But I think we're going to see a bit of regression from 2020 only because 2020 was an exaggerated year. And I don't think that he would have continued on at the pace that he was that season had it gone to a full season. I, I think this is a guy that will be a quality major league hitter. I don't think that he's a bad hitter by any means, but I don't think that the 2020 numbers were an accurate representation of him. I think he will regress a little bit, but he still will be good. I don't think that he's going to be bad for the Blue Jays. He's a good option off the bench. He's a good option if you want to have him at first base. And I think that he will be used as as long as he can be on on this team. And it's somebody I wonder about because for Rand, someone like Randall Grichuk, who we've gone over, who is, you know, another guy, in my opinion, where the 2020 numbers are a little bit over exaggerated, but so far uh, throughout this past week, he's been proving everyone wrong, including me, and he still has an OPS above 900. So he's producing still, and it's safe to say once George Springer is ready, I think he's earned himself somewhere, no matter if they're going to be rotating DH or right field, left field, he's going to be in that lineup as well when George Springer returns. And that's someone that affects Rowdy Telez. I don't, I don't know what happens with Rowdy Telez at that point. You know, you assume he's going to just be starting less, maybe appearing more late in games. We've seen him pinch it a few times late this season in a few games. But uh, someone like Rowdy Telez, uh, you know, for his sake, he's got to get going because George Springer is getting closer. We're expecting hopefully next weekend at the earliest uh, during the Jays road trip where they start in Kansas City. And, um, you know, I just, all I know is the clock's ticking on that. And, you know, it's safe to say right now, Grichik has earned himself a spot to stay in this lineup, uh, regardless if it's sustainable or not. And someone like Rowdy Telez is putting himself in a, in a deep hole. And I, I even mentioned a couple of weeks ago, his spring overall wasn't um, that good as well. So it just hasn't been a good start for Rowdy Telez. And it's something, that, it's something that has always kind of held me back from believing in him or taking him as somebody who is, you know, legit, because I've always had trouble adjusting to that because I know uh, the previous numbers for Rowdy Telez in 2019 was an example. And that's why I'm waiting to see it in a full season, because that's why I'm not taking too much out of 2020 from Rowdy Telez. I just need to see more to be legit. Do I think he's a good player? Yes. And I do think he's got a good, um, I guess, responsibility and a good role on this team. But right now they're just, it's starting to, you know, clog up for him. And it's not becoming as clear. So we'll see what happens there, but lots of uh, takeaways of good players, bad players, you know, Danny Jansen, another one and even Alejandro Kirk I don't think he's gotten a hit yet or he hasn't done good so far so the catching position as a whole it's been a little bit of a concern offensively so you know you know you got to imagine eventually some of these guys are going to get going I think when Springer comes back which is looking like it's a little bit farther down the line than we want um, I wouldn't expect him to be back at all in the next series against the Yankees probably not even the series after that So it's not looking great for him coming back. But by the time he does come back, if Rowdy Telez is still scuffling to the extent he is right now, of course, expect him to have a hit by that point. But if he's still not, you know, hitting well consistently, I think you have to consider sending him down to the alternate site. Because, I I mean, just look at the facts. Like, you have a guy in Randall Grishik who has nowhere to play once Springer's back, assuming Guriel and Hernandez are back from their quarantine and, um, COVID IL, assuming they're back, you have nowhere to play Randall Grishik except for DH. And that puts Rowdy Telez on the bench. You don't want to carry a guy like Rowdy Telez on the bench if he's hitting 100, you know, 150. He's not going to get into the game at all. And he's not going to figure things out offensively if he's on the bench only batting, you know, once every couple of games and he's still hitting 150. So 
I think that's the only solution if things stay they will the, the way they are. You know, Rowdy Telez tomorrow could come out, have two home runs, and be back on track. Um, you could have Randall Grishik cool down because we know he runs hot and cold. But assuming things stay the way they are right now, I don't really see a place for Rowdy Telez on the roster once George Springer comes back from the injured list. We'll see. Also, we got to remember that there are more than just Rowdy Telez and Randall Grichik that need need a place to play. Because say you put Rowdy Telez at first base, which I believe he did play at first uh, either yesterday or in the first game against the Angels. So when you do that, do you put Vladdy at DH? Do you put him at third base? And if you put him at third, where do you put Biggio? So it just the Blue Jays. I'll go back to what I said all throughout spring training. The Blue Jays have such a crowded pool of position players that we we really needed something to, to figure itself out. And I think with Rowdy Telez, unfortunately, so far, he has proved that maybe the figuring it out is that he is not going to hit as well as we expected him to. And then you can't, you can't play him because I'm, I'm, I don't want to harp on the guy, but at the same time, this is a team that we're expecting to play deep into October and you can't have a guy that is not helping you win. And with, with Randall Gritchick, I think we all, are cautiously optimistic because as you said, he, you know, I, I believe that the first season he had with the blue Jays, he was hitting under 100 for the first couple of months. He went on the, the injured list came back and was hitting around 400. So he's a, he's a guy that can easily heat up and cool down, but as long, at least for now, while he's in this, in this hot streak, I don't see why you take him out of the lineup. And if you keep him at your designated hang spot, especially when Springer comes back, I'm not taking Guerrero out either because then, why, why would you take that bout out of the lineup? And do you put Telez at first base because of that or at DH? I just, it doesn't make sense to me. And it's, it's a sad thing for R- Rowdy Telez, but it, in terms of the team, I think that might end up being the most likely option, even if he does start to hit, because obviously, as we said, he is going to hit, but is he going to hit consistent enough to stay in the lineup and justify his position or his, his name taking up the designated hitting spot? And I, I don't know if that will end up happening. Yeah, if, if that's the case, you know, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would just take out more reps at first base. And then, of course, you would, when eventually when Teoscar comes back, uh, I could see him and Grichik flipping from DH and right field because obviously Teoscar Hernandez isn't the greatest fielder himself. So either way, there's there's room for Grichik if they bench Telez or if they send him down uh, a possible stint like Mark was mentioning. So if that happens, uh, you know, Telez would be going to the alternate site for a little bit until – uh, the triple A season starts would be, which would be around May. So there's lots of, op, you know, there, there's a, there's room for Grichik if they make enough room for him. It, and, but unfortunately that leaves Telez as the odd man out. So it'll be interesting to see, but um, I, I just, I don't know, like Rowdy Telez, it's not like he's hitting hard contact and he's being unlucky. He just doesn't look comfortable whatsoever. He's chasing um, a lot of weak contact. It's just, it's not good out of Rowdy Telez right now it's and you know usually when people are, are in slumps like that there's a chance that they're hitting it well it's just you know unfortunately going right to a fielder or something like that you're not seeing any of that with Rowdy Telez so far so it is a bit of a concern and going back to 2019 that's what we saw from Rowdy Telez is that he had to eventually go down for a minor league stint he came back and he obviously hit better still not what the Jays were probably hoping for but it's just um, inconsistency so that's the problem with Rowdy Telez unfortunately just hasn't been comfortable yet consistently at the major league level could he get there at some point yes could he turn it around this week absolutely but we really don't know and as of now today it's not looking good so that's the one of the, obviously one of the, the the downfalls of this team so far and we've been we've already discussed people who have taken off so far so this lineup will eventually gel together i'm confident it will it will even people like lord escurial jr who's another one who traditionally starts slow so we'll see what happens with that one but this offense as a whole give them time. And I think, um, you know, obviously Saturday was one game. They didn't play today on the Sunday. So obviously have to see a little bit more before we, you know, take anything new out of this offense and saying, all right, now they're finally getting going. Cause unfortunately it was just a one spot on Saturday, but it was still optimistic to see them put up 15 runs. Yeah. And this like, like talking about Raddy to not hitting isn't to panic. Like talking about Lourdes Gurriel jr. Not hitting. It's not panicking. It's just saying, this is the problem we have right now. We need to be able to deal with it and, you know, look ahead at what the potential solutions are for the Blue Jays. And even sending Rowdy Tellez down, like, I don't know. To me, that's not like a punishment. To me, it's not like saying, you know, this is the end of the world. Rowdy Tellez is not panned out. It's saying, you know, you need to fix something. Something's not working right now. You know, take a break. Let's look at it in the alternate training site. Let's focus a little bit more 
on your swing, on your contact, see what's happening, and we can work on it, improve it, get him back in the majors. So to me, it's just, you know, taking a little pause, making him work. And I should mention in yesterday's game, he wasn't exactly helped by the umpire. Um, the, the ball and strike calls, there was a couple questionable calls on his at bat that kind of screwed him over and maybe took away potentially his first hit or even an additional walk to get him on base, which, you know, anything helps when you're scuffling like this, but again, like sending him down, isn't hitting the panic button. It's not saying you're over, we're done with you. It's just saying you need a couple weeks to work on things. That's totally fine. Same thing happened to Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Look at him. Exactly. He wasn't panning out yep. in the infield. He was struggling. They sent him down, and now look at it. He's arguably an all-star or could be an all-star in the future. He has the potential. And um, before you guys move on, I just wanted to you know, say a little bit of a fun fact because obviously the game today on the Sunday got postponed, and it's going to be rescheduled for a doubleheader in August. So when you look at it now, uh, not only are the Blue Jays going to be flipping homes at some point this season to Buffalo or Toronto, but now there is for sure a chance that one, the Blue Jays are a home team in Dunedin. They will be eventually in Buffalo. That's almost a lock. There's the hopeful for Toronto eventually later in the year. And now they're going to have one home game in Anaheim. So, you know, I know uh, last year was weird enough when they were the home game or they were the home team at Fenway park where okay. Blue Jays was playing at Fenway park. That was weird enough, but in Washington, you know, I and Washington, too. yeah, that's when I guess Buffalo wasn't ready, and then that was like the last second uh, announcement that they're going to go to Buffalo. So just another weird year where they're going to be a home team in Anaheim, and uh, they're going to be obviously moving at some point to Buffalo for sure. So uh, I feel it's you know it's just it's unfortunate, but we just miss them here in Toronto. One thing I thought was funny when they announced today that they're playing the doubleheader in Anaheim with you know one and one, one home game, one road game. I think the home game time was 3.07 instead of like 3.05 or 3.10 because we know the Blue Jays always start the games at seven minutes past the hour or half hour if it's like a 12.37 start time. So I thought that was funny, a little cute ode to what the Blue Jays always do. So anyways, we'll one see. name I wanted to mention as well before we turn to some of the standout pitching performances and some of the disappointing pitching performances is Josh Palacios. Of course, everyone knows that name now. It's a household name, but we talked about him during spring training, was tearing it up then. Didn't make the cut on opening day, but you know, being called up quickly after. Insane game yesterday. He had four hits, four runs scored, which was the first time someone has done that in the first two games of their career since 1901. That's going back to the, you know, before the first World Series in 1903, before the modern era. That's how long it's been, 120 years since someone has done this before. Um, he's the third rookie in Blue Jay history to do this and the um, second number nine hitter in Blue Jay history to do this after Chris Woodward, manager of the Texas Rangers. Um, so crazy games for him. Um, it's awesome to see him up and hitting in the majors. And while we're talking about roster space, Unfortunately, there's probably not roster space for him in the majors. And Jonathan Davis, he's going to be fighting for space there, um, which is, of course, another question. But it's awesome to see him hitting. We're, of course, going to see more of him this season, and I hope it can keep up. Um, let's turn to the pitching side of things. The first name that I think we should mention to kick things off with is Tanner Rourke. Of course, everyone was freaking out after his first start of the season. It was horrible, and horrible is you know, a light word to use for what it was, five earned runs three innings pitched, three home runs, only two strikeouts. Um, didn't struggle with command, I guess. He didn't walk anybody. That's because everyone was just hitting everything he threw. Um, like and <laughs> after that game, people were kind of like, okay, the, the Tanner Rourke experiment is over. The diesel truck has run out of fuel. We have to move on from him. Uh, he was supposed to start today for the Blue Jays. Of course, it got rained out. I think today was kind of maybe like the final straw is kind of what we were hearing from the Blue Jays. And then after the game, Charlie Montoyo says he's moving to the bullpen. He's going to be a long reliever from this point forward. They're not ruling out moving him back to the rotation, maybe he figures things out in the bullpen. But right now, it seems like he's done as a starter, maybe for the rest of his career. You know, he's 34. Not sure how much is left in the tank for him. Uh, is this the best solution for him? Like for me, this is, I mean, obviously it's not best case scenario, but this is the best decision the Blue Jays can make. When he's pitching like this, 
you don't just want to eat that salary. He may still be a good pitcher. Like he may still have more in the tank that he can give. So I'm willing to try him out in the bullpen, see how it goes. Maybe the stuff plays if he's only going one, two innings, giving it all he's got instead of, I guess, three innings and giving up five runs to the Rangers. So I'm Any willing practice. to see how this turns out. It's the best case scenario for the Blue Jays. We'll see how long this experiment lasts, whether it works out, whether the Blue Jays DFA him, release him, whatever. But I think this is the best move the Blue Jays can make with horrible circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I personally do think the best option is to just eat the contract and not utilize his services. Because hear me out, and I know all throughout the beginning of, of the season and spring training, we all said, give guys time if they're if they have a bad start to the season allow it, you know, give them some time. But I think with Tanner Rourke, we knew what we were getting out of him. And I don't think that his one start or his first start of the season against the Rangers was his way of of necessarily auditioning to stay in the rotation. I think this, this was his way of saying, okay, this is his Hail Mary cry right now. Because hear me out, he has a 383 career ERA, which is not terrible. It's it's decent. 680 ERA last Better than year. Trevor Bowers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the funny thing. But the problem is, is his ERA has not been below four since 2016. So take out his first couple of seasons where he had a sub two ERA, I believe, and you've got a guy with a very high ERA. And I think the problem is, is we know what we were getting out of Tanner Roark and his first start of the season was just a confirmation of that. And don't get me wrong. I would love to see him rebound. And obviously he plays for the team that I support. So I'm not going to say that I want him to play bad, but if he's going to be this way, I don't see the need for him in the rotation or in the bullpen. I mean, he is a UFA at the end of the season, so he can walk. I think that's what's going to end up happening. But before that, I think the Blue Jays do need to eat the contract and just not have him pitch. Because realistically for me, the way I look at this is I think the Blue Jays, and I think you guys can agree with me, I think they're going to go to the playoffs, maybe make a deep run, but they're going to play in the playoffs regardless. And they're going to play meaningful games. And do I see Tanner Roark pitching in those meaningful games? Probably not. Take uh, Drew Hutchison from 2015, for an example. He had an ERA of, I, th- I believe it was 550. It was around mid fives. And his record, I think, was 13 and two. So he, on paper, sort of looked good. But then you remember that he didn't pitch towards the end of the season. He didn't pitch in the playoffs because he was allowing so many runs. And that's kind of what I see out of Tanner Roark right now. He's a guy that could pitch, but realistically I don't know if I want to put that risk out there because if you're playing a a meaningful game the last thing you want to do is pray that your your offense comes through and bails out your pitching and that's I think the the biggest thing that we've noticed throughout the beginning of the season is the pitching has been pretty good so far but the offense I don't think is the offense has not been what we expect it to be and I think because of that we can we can make the conclusion that a good offense cannot bail out bad pitching and we saw that the game against the Texas Rangers that Tanner Rourke started easily winnable game they scored four runs problem is is the texas rangers had five home runs off of their starter or off the blue jays start or sorry three home runs off the blue jays starter so it's i I don't know if i want to see that again i I do want to see the blue jays consistently consistency win and just i'm sorry for tenor Rourke, but he's just he's been a liability for the blue jays ever since he's came here and I, i really want to see them move on from that and fill that role with somebody else because I do think that they have guys that could take over in the rotation. Obviously, Steven Matz has been a fantastic addition. I do think Anthony Kay has a role as a starter. Nate Pearson, hopefully he's coming back eventually. Robbie Ray's coming back soon. So they have guys that can take over. And I just, I, I don't see Tanner Roark fitting on a healthy Blue Jays roster. And I think that's just the, the only solution for him right now. You see, for me and for, I guess, a lot of Blue Jays fans, all those questions, Jacob, you went over were answered last year when they saw him pitch. And all of this was known going into the offseason. This was known in the spring. And the, the question I have is, if they give him one start, and they did, they gave him the one start, they were going to give him the second start. Why even bother Why even bother him making the team as a, a starter? I, I don't understand. When you look back at it now, Why? Like, why not just start him in the bullpen like they probably were envisioning since the spring? They probably knew this was happening and this was going to come up. They gave him one start. They were supposed to give him two. 
and probably wouldn't be much more than two. Why not just do this right away? You had Jacob, you've already mentioned it. So many other options to do this. You know, there's Anthony K who can start. And of course, Robbie Ray, who's someone that had a really good spring. And I'm very excited to see him pitch on Monday, who comes back and is going to be officially activated off the injured list. I just wish that, you know, from something that we already knew last year, why was this not addressed right on opening day? And why couldn't you just start it in the bullpen then? And I'm, you know, I disagree. I think uh, them moving to the bullpen or moving him to the bullpen is the best case right now. I'm not uh, a firm believer in eating the contract just yet until you get every single thing out of him. Clearly you got every single thing as a starter out of him. And, you know, to say it nicely, it went over as a failure. I think that's to say it as nice as possible. And now you, you know, he's going to be going to the bullpen. He's going to be in a long relief role give him the chance. Um, I'm all for that with the money he's making. He's making $12 million this year. It's the final year of his contract. And not only will he be walking, the Blue Jays won't even be calling him back. So give him a chance. Let him ride out the season as a reliever. Try it. I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm not saying he's going to last there long, but I just look back now and say, what was the point of not just doing this last week when on opening day when I look back at it now, but either way, you know, a lot of people saying too today was probably the best rain out of all time as they get to avoid the finale, the final run of the diesel truck. And I'm just saying, I know the diesel truck started slow and I know the diesel truck is bad at, or was bad at starting for this team. Maybe the diesel truck can be good out of a bullpen. I know he starts slow, but maybe the diesel truck can adjust, give the diesel truck a chance and this is the final straw. Don't release him yet. Give him a chance as a reliever. I don't know how long of a leash you give him as a reliever because we all know that the, I guess this team's competing and this can't be happening as much. Maybe you start him off in mop-up roles, which is fine. And if he pitches well, maybe be careful, but slowly, you know, maybe increase the workload just a bit, but don't overreact with Tanner Roark. But unfortunately this was all answered last year. And, you know, a lot of people were wondering why he was pitching as deep into the season as he was obviously he didn't make the oh uh the postseason roster and he stopped i think they skipped one of his starts near the end of the year i just i look back now and say what was the point of doing this if they already knew because i'm sure this was determined months ago give him a couple of chances and move him to the bullpen i just i don't know what optimism they were looking for i understand you want to give him you know i guess you want to try and give him an opportunity but this was all answered for everyone last year Why didn't you just start the year in the bullpen? That's what I look back at now and wonder why. I know the injuries are there. I know if you want to counter that, yes, the team got injured. But even with the healthy rotation, with Robbie Ray being ready, it is a fact that he would have been that fifth starter. So I'm not even going to look at injuries and say the the rotation's beat up. That's why he's there. He was there even with a healthy Robbie Ray. And everyone knows that because TJ Zoic was the last guy to fill his spot. So that's the one thing where injuries aren't even an excuse for that as well. Yeah, if I had to... Well, I guess, I don't know. I think the reason why is because, like, the Blue Jays were hopeful about him. They thought he could reinvent himself. We heard stuff about, you know, him tunneling his pitches and working on making, you know, improving his pitches, making them look the same out of his hand and look the same for a really long time before they, you know, split up into whether it's fastball changeup. Um, we heard so much about that in spring training. We didn't see the results in spring training. He had one good start to start things off I think and then you know his last start he had to come out in the second inning and go back out in the third inning because it's spring training but we heard so much about what he was trying to do to reinvent himself so I was willing to give him a chance and frankly you know maybe this is an outlandish thing to say and a little bit controversial thing to say but I'm kind of still willing to give him a chance in the rotation like it was (laughs) it was one start it's That's only one on start. It's it's only three innings. Like we're talking about small sample size with these hitters, giving Rowdy Telez more of a chance after 23 plate appearances. To some extent, we have to give Tanner Rourke a little bit more of a chance. It's only three innings. So I'm not saying we throw him out there, take him out of the rotation of the all-star break. I'm just saying give him one, two more starts, and then we can see what we have for sure. I don't think he's going to give us a lot. I'm not incredibly help, hopeful about what he can be. I'm just saying there might be more than what meets the eye. We have to, I, when we're talking small sample size with hitters, I want to give the same fairness to Tanner Rourke. 
not saying again I think he's going to be any better when he does come back if he does come back but anyways that's my controversial take for the day he is not making one more start for this team I'm saying it now he is not making one more start for this team he's not I don't know (laughs) how do you say that I just I like well like it's one start against a rebuilding Texas team. I know, but everyone has <laughs> bad days. Everyone has. Hyunjin Ryu started last season horribly. Like he had one good start on opening day, and then he had you know one or two bad starts. Right. So you don't take Hyunjin Ryu out of the rotation. And yes, it's completely different. Hyunjin Ryu has he has a good track record, but I I still think he deserves at least one more start. Again, I think the Blue Jays are probably right in that he has nothing more in him. Move him to the bullpen, which again, I like a lot more than just cutting him because might as well see what he's got if you're paying him $12 million anyways. But I agree with that. I think as painful as it sounds and as painful as it might be, I wanted just one or two more starts. We are grateful he did not pitch. that. Hang on. That that weekend (laughs) in New York, we are grateful he did not take the mound. Okay, Jacob, what's your take on this? I was going to say maybe the Blue Jays use him in an opener situation. Maybe he either starts or he comes out of the out of relief to somebody. I mean, we've seen, seen them do that throughout the season. We saw them last season do that. So maybe they give him two to three innings, see if he has anything left in the tank. But if he doesn't and if he still struggles, I, I think he's released. I, I still don't know if the bullpen is the best option because also I, the bullpen has been a little shaky at, at times especially earlier on with uh, their, the back end of it, but with a healthy bullpen and a fan and a, and a thriving bullpen, I still don't think that there's anywhere for Tanner Roark to fit. I just, he either needs to be a starter or not, a, or not on the team at all. And unfortunately, I just, I don't think he's been the starter that the Blue Jays wanted him to be. He is a diesel truck who starts slow. Can as an opener. Bullpen though. That's yeah. Him. I don't, oh my I don't like God. the idea of, him as an opener. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't want him as an no, opener. No, 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 no. I wouldn't want him as an. No, opener. don't do, don't do this for me. I don't. <laughs> don't but do like, I, I also see the same problem if you put him in the bullpen and say he comes out and you say, okay, you get you get yeah. one inning, two innings, three innings at max. If he's if he's starting slow, you can't start slow when you only have two innings to pitch. You have to be Which, on your game. And but but for me, the difference is like you when he's coming out of the bullpen, you can choose what situations he goes into. You can choose to only pitch him in 15 to one game. Yesterday is a perfect game. Yeah. Perfect game for him yesterday. yesterday. He he is not coming out with when it's within four runs. Absolutely not. (laughs) Yesterday, (laughs) a perfect, perfect opportunity for him to come in yesterday. 10, nothing by the second or whatever it was. Oh man. I just, this scares me that, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I don't want him starting again. I, there's no way he starts again for this team. I can't see it. It looks like you're going to get your way. It does not look like he is making a single start more for this team. And like I said, probably a good thing, but I would have liked just to one more try, see what he has in him. But anyways, we'll leave it there. We'll move on to more bright spots in the rotation, which is Steven Matz, of course. I mean, we talked, I, I don't think we talked about his first start because it came against Texas after that series um, against the Yankees, but just absolutely phenomenal in his first outing. Nine strikeouts to one walk. I think that's the second most amount of strikeouts in a debut as a Blue Jay for a pitcher in Blue Jay history. The number one is David Price. Um, back in 2015, he struck out 11. Um, Matt's went 6.1 innings, one earned run allowed. Like I said, one walk, nine strikeouts, no home runs, a 1.42 ERA. Um, he got into the seventh inning, which we have not seen at all, really, for any pitcher. I mean, we saw it high injury once last season, but incredible performance by Steven Matz, and he backed it up yesterday in that 15-1 to game. Not that the Blue Jays needed it in that game, but six innings, one run allowed, three walks, four strikeouts, so a little bit more iffy there, but the one run came on a solo shot. Um, I think it was Anthony Rendon, if I'm remembering correctly. So uh, fantastic outings from him so far, and when we talk about the best-case scenario for the rotation, obviously Robbie Ray and Nate Pearson – play a role in that best case scenario but Steven Matz being who he has been so far this season is that best case scenario for him Blue Jays got one heck of a bargain out of him I'll tell you that but the thing that I'm liking is we talked about this with Rowdy Tellez and how he didn't have a very good spring training and he's not having a good start to a season 
Steven Matz had a fantastic spring training. Uh, he had 15 and a third innings pitched, a 176 ERA, and a 978 whip. So that is actually, I would say that's pretty good. And in roughly the same amount of innings, uh, a couple less, he's pitched 12 and a third innings this season so far in his first two starts. He has a 146 ERA, which, uh, you know what, I think, I, I don't know that this is necessarily, or at least it should come to a surprise to us because Steven Matz was fantastic in spring training. And I think this is just a continuation of whatever the heck he was doing down in Dunedin, where well, he still is in Dunedin, I guess you can say, but he has been absolutely fantastic this season. And hey, all credit to him. Uh, I was a little bit hesitant, you know, as I said, as uh, Bryson, you can attest to, I was very, I, I was very harsh on the lack of signing a, a solidified starter, but Steven Matz is proving to be that solidified starter. And I think last week I wanted to say that I was at least reversing my opinion on that trade and saying that Steven Matz was great. And I think both of you said, relax, it's one start against the Texas Rangers, but he was great against the, the angels too. And, you know, you got great guys like Pujols, Uh, Mike Trout, the best baseball player in the history of baseball, and you can't argue with me on that. But he was fantastic. Can argue on maybe, (laughs) maybe. Anyway, Uh, (laughs) no, I was gonna say, but Stephen Matz, he was great in both of his starts, and I think that again, I've said this a million times. We've all said this. It's still early. No, maybe we should rename the podcast. It's still early, but I will say that Stephen Matz was great. And I'm eager to see what he's able to continue doing because I think he's a great lefty option, especially in the playoffs. You know, you, I mean, do I think that they would go Ryu, Ray, and then Matt, three lefties in a, the same series? Maybe not, but still he's a good bullpen option in the playoffs and I'm getting way ahead of myself right now, but you get what I mean. Steven Matz is a fantastic pitcher this season and I'm eager to see what he's going to do and what, how he's going to continue with this, especially as guys start to get healthy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Jacob, I mean, I mean, it still gets me excited that you're talking about the playoff rotation. I like that. So I'm not even going to shame you for that at all. I really <laughs> I like that. But, you know, the thing with Steven Matz, too, especially his start yesterday, and I'm sure you obviously everyone noticed they were showing it a lot on TV, was the amount of time he had, you know, when the Jays were up to hit. He was doing everything he could to stay warm. Uh, early on, I think it was the second inning, he went to the bullpen. As That was a really long inning. So he was doing everything he could to stay loose, stay warm. And that's why yesterday's start was more impressive for me because of that, for those reasons, I know he had a huge lead and low stress and all of that, but the fact that he was able to stay loose during all the, that time impressed me the most. And I mean, when you look back to what his first two starts, uh, they're pretty identical in terms of what he did for his pitching line, uh, obviously less strikeouts yesterday than what he had in Texas. Um, Yesterday on the Saturday was four strikeouts. Texas was nine, but in both outings, he went uh, six innings at least and uh, one earned run. So, you know, Steven Matz as well. People, maybe this is the Pete Walker effect that people keep talking about. We're starting to see it with Robbie Ray. Well, we, we hope we see it this year. I know he hasn't started yet, but throughout the spring and last year, we saw it. Steven Matz, I think you can make that argument. I know we're two starts in and I still want to see more from the starting pitching, Jacob. So I know that, you know, it's good news that you were warmed up to it, but people like Ross Stripling, um, you know, hasn't gotten off to the greatest start. I need to see more from Ross Stripling. Hunjin Ryu, I think we all kind of expected his start to be really good. But Steven Matz as well, he's got a 167 average against him. And that's pretty impressive. A whip below one, it's at 0.89. And someone like Hunjin Ryu as well has the exact same thing. So uh, really impressive start at 146 ERA to start the year. And um, when you look at it, now we need other players to, or other pitches to start going. So Robbie Ray is back tomorrow officially on the Monday. And TJ Zoic obviously did not have a spectacular start on Friday, but I don't, I give him a little bit of a uh, pass because first of all, you both know my opinion on the opener. I think that completely screwed him up. I'm still going to live by that. Obviously it could have, it could have, maybe it didn't, but I give him a pass for that because I was not in support of the opener. I still not. And that's why I had a hard time, you know, accepting that on Friday, but I understand the philosophy or the reasoning behind it was that you wanted to avoid Mike Trout. I believe that was the reasoning for it, but I think TJ Zoic deserves another start and uh, we'll see what happens with that. But Ross Stripling is another one we're still waiting on. So we're still waiting on a couple pitchers to get going and uh, Hunjin Ryu and Steven Matz are the two bright spots right now. And uh, you hope this uh, keeps up. I think with Hunjin Ryu, I think we're expecting it to keep up, but Steven Matz, I think we're all interested in to see if he can maintain this because it's a pretty impressive start. Uh, and two starts as well. He came into the season as the fifth starter, uh, and uh, he's he's done really well so far. And very impressive. Yeah, you know, people have been 
critical of Ross Stripling, but honestly, I'm kind of happy with what he's done for the Blue Jays. Like, not great numbers. Again, there is reason to be critical. Like, five innings his last outing, he gave up four runs. 3.1 innings his first outing, um, three runs. But for a guy who, like, wasn't really expecting to be in the rotation, yes, he had time to ramp things up. Yes, he, you know, got stretched out in spring training. He's known that he's going to be in the rotation for a little bit, but for a guy that was never supposed to be in the rotation, you know, if Robbie Ray and Nate Pearson were healthy, I think he's held his own. Again, not perfect situation, but I think he's, you know, he's been an appropriate stopgap for the Blue Jays. Um, speaking of Robbie Ray, we know he's coming back tomorrow against the Yankees. I'm really excited for that. The performance that we've seen out of Steven Matz, like Matz's ability to translate his spring training numbers into actual real game time numbers this season gives me hope for Robbie Ray because Robbie Ray's numbers in spring training out of all the pitchers on the Blue Jays staff were the most impressive. Um, his strikeout to walk ratio and even just his strike to ball ratio was outlandishly good. And of course, we know that's his huge problem. The biggest problem with his um, pitching repertoire and command is his command. So the fact that we've seen Mats be able to translate that performance across to regular season gives me extreme hope for Robbie Ray and like I said best case scenario Robbie Ray comes back he's who we thought he is in spring training right he puts up similar numbers to what he was in spring training Steven Matz keeps doing doing this Ryu is Ryu and then you know you throw out TJ Zoik and Ross Stripling you know two times a week that's a pretty good situation. Um, and, and then Nate Pearson is going to come back eventually. And then maybe you throw a bullpen day out there. And we know some of these guys in the bullpen, the long arms, they've been doing pretty good this season so far. Of course, some struggles along the way, but that's the best case scenario. Um, Steven Matz plays a large role in that. And I'm very um, hopeful and happy with what he's done so far this season. Yeah. And the thing was too, uh, Mark, I know, you know, the thing with Ross Stripling is he's come out and said twice now that he he's happy with what like how he's been throwing. And, you know, he thinks that his stuff's there, you know, maybe some um, unfortunate, you know, ways that his starts have gone. But, yeah, I'm not worried about Stripling also. I just obviously we want to see more out of him. But we know what Ross Stripling uh, brings. And that's why it it's you know, I'm not I'm not concerned with Ross Stripling. I, I, I agree with you on that one. But, you know, the fact that he's coming out and saying that he's happy with how he's throwing as well, he thinks he's throwing well. I think that gives you some optimism as well, is that it's eventually going to start going his way, or at least the numbers will start showing that. So I, I agree with you on that one. Yeah, just wanted to get that in there. Well, also, I think we should mention, or at least be aware of the fact that he only pitched five innings in his debut and then three and a third in his second start. So numbers are going to be a little... Other way around. Actually. Oh, was it? Uh, yeah. Well, either way, he has not pitched a lot of innings. So numbers, I think, are a little bit exaggerated because even if you allow two runs over that, that's going to very drastically influence your ERA. So, again, it's it's early. I think with, with Ross Stripling, it's kind of the opposite of Tanner Roark is we do need a bit more time to, to really get an opinion on him. And he, he I think he does deserve more, of, not more of a chance than, than Tanner Roark, but at least has a bit longer of a leash. I think the Blue Jays have a bit more leniency with him. And they have him, I think, this season and next season. So might as well get the use out of him. You know, figure out wh where he fits on this team because he's going to be here next year. And I think I'm, I'm confident in, in the fact that he will turn this around. And once he gets some more innings in, under his belt, he will he will be the pitcher that we expect him to be. Oh, yeah, not even in the same stratosphere with Tanner Rorick. But, yeah, yeah, one by one good start, and it, it will go down. And that's why this opening week is why we everyone over-exaggerates. And uh, numbers are high, numbers are low. And eventually it'll all balance out. So yeah, Stripling, I'm sure it'll start going his way. Obviously two starts now it hasn't, but he's, he's confident in what he's throwing and that gives you enough to believe that it'll go the other way eventually for him. Okay. Um, let's mention briefly just all the players that are out right now. It's a very long list. So I know I'm going to forget some guys here and there, but hey, let me try go. to get them all. Ryan Barucki was out for a day. He is now back. He was on the COVID IL with vaccine symptoms um, or uh, side effects from the vaccine. Lourdes Goriel Jr. is currently on that list with side effects from the vaccine. Teoscar Hernandez is out because he had an exposure to someone who tested positive. He has to quarantine for seven days, and then he can come back, assuming he does test negative after that seven-day quarantine. Tyler Chatwood is on the injured list with an actual injury. I think he has a strained 
uh, sorry, tricep inflammation. Um, and then there's the guys that we already knew were out, Nate Pearson, Robbie Ray, we mentioned coming back tomorrow. Um, George Springer is still out. I think that's everyone. <laughs> you know, it's a long list, so I'm not sure if I forgot anyone in there. But I think just for- Hatch, and then you're good, yeah. Hatch, right. Thomas yeah. Hatch is still out, which we haven't heard anything about him. We're still, I guess, kind of hopeful for like early mid-May return for him, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, it's a lot of injuries, but for a team like – it's all on the pitching side, seems like. I I mean, it, with the exception of um, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and Teoscar Hernandez, but that's COVID-related. I'm not even worried about that. But when you do think, you know, you are missing out on these guys, even if it's COVID-related for just a couple of days, are you concerned that, you know, they're not as deep as maybe we'd like them to be, especially going into a good uh, pivotal series against the Yankees? Are we concerned that they don't maybe have some of the depth that makes them as good a team as they normally are? Or you kind of just, you know, going with the flow. That's where I'm at. I'm like, it's, you really can't control if you're exposed to someone to COVID-19. I'm not even going to worry about it. And Teoscar Hernandez isn't really hitting right now. What is Gurriel Jr. isn't hitting right now, but he's going to come back probably tomorrow. He probably would have been back in today's game because it's just side effects from the vaccine. So I'm not worried about it at all. Maybe it does hurt depth in the bullpen a little bit with these guys, but I'm not going to stress about it because it is just a couple days it's just a few minor injuries um and and injury lead injured list stints so i'm not worried about it mm, i i really don't think that there is too much to be to be worried about because i mean obviously we hope everyone's okay we hope nothing lingers beyond any time frame that we've already been given but i don't think that that's going to happen i think the case will be that guys come back the second they're ready and even with Lourdes Gurriel Jr., I, Charlie Montoyo said in the post-game interview the day that he was taken out of the game that begin, the beginning of the day he was fine, but then he just started to undergo some symptoms in the in the actual dugout. So it could just be a one-time thing. I'm sure we've all had the flu, a cold, you know, some type of thing that just hits you out of nowhere and then it goes away after a couple of days. So we'll hope that that's what the case is. We obviously hope that he's okay. Uh, but I really don't think that the Blue Jays are going to be lacking. I mean, well, they are lacking the depth, but I don't think that lacking of depth will negatively influence them because I do think that the bullpen has been pretty good so far this year. And again, it's only a couple of days. So worst case, you call somebody up, as we've seen Anthony Case not even with the team yet. So maybe you bring him up, you you shuffle the 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 bullpen and the rotation up a little bit. Unless you completely mismanage the entire roster, I don't think that this will be much of a problem for the Blue Jays. So I'm not overly worried. Once guys come back, I think this team is still lethal and hopefully they can play in Toronto so we can see this lethalness. If I'm on board with that one. Uh, yeah, I, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, I, I, I remember saying that they have the depth and we all know they do. Just obviously the question mark is some of these guys still haven't proven themselves, which give you a little bit of a question mark and that is more towards the bullpen. But either way, they do have the pieces to do it. And when you look at it now in terms of people they've called up since. I know Ty Tice has made his debut now. Uh, Santiago Espinal, you know, he came out on fire on or yesterday when he made his debut. And he was somebody that was on the team for a good bulk of last year. So he was, and he was this close to making the team uh, this year. Of course, he fell behind Joe Panic, And of course, Josh Palacios, another one who is, I guess, the fifth outfielder on this team, just behind Jonathan Davis. So another one who had a really good debut and all these guys, are just itching for opportunities. So, you know, Jacob, we went over this way at the beginning and you said it too. They're just a crowded team with a crowded, I guess, you know, hitters, which is why I think a lot of these guys deserve a shot. And I'm not concerned about it with that. Of course, pitching is where it's just that a lot of these guys haven't proven them, themselves yet. So you hope that these guys come back as soon as possible. Someone like Thomas Hatch would be a great addition back to the bullpen. And of course, um, Ross Stripling, I, I assume when everyone gets healthy, he may head back to the bullpen, which will be a good addition to the bullpen as well. So I'm not uh, too overly concerned with it now. Robbie Ray's coming back on the Monday, which is tomorrow. And um, yeah, Mark, I'm just going with the flow. I think you said it perfectly there. So nothing to be overly concerned about right now. Yeah, maybe this is kind of perverse of me, but I honestly think it's kind of funny people going out for COVID side effects from the vaccine. I think that's like, it's such an absurd absurd sequence of events that we find ourselves you know playing a game in a global pandemic and people are being injured 
because they have a vaccine like they're either their arm is sore or you know you do get flu-like symptoms after the second dose we know that i just think it's kind of funny it's a once in a lifetime thing and it doesn't seem to be hurting the blue jays at all so i might as well enjoy it along the way um a few bucket list things or laundry list things to run through before we end the podcast um Ross Adkins extended five years. We saw Mark Shapiro extend five years earlier in the offseason. Uh, big whoop, no big deal. I think we were all expecting it. We knew that the Blue Jays were working towards an extension because Mark Shapiro had said as much publicly expected. They've done a good job. We're all on the same page there. Um, the Buffalo Bisons have announced that they're not going to be playing home games to start the season in Buffalo because, of course, they are expecting the Blue Jays to move up to Buffalo in mid to end of May or early June. They're going to be moving to Trenton, New Jersey. They're playing at the former home of the Trenton Thunder. And the weirdest thing about this is that they're going to be at home. They're going to be playing as a Trenton Thunder. They're going to be wearing Thunder jerseys. Yeah, I guess you didn't know this, Bryson, but they're going to be wearing Thunder jerseys. But on the road, they're going to be Buffalo Bisons and they're going to be wearing (laughs) Bisons jerseys. It's bizarre, and when the general manager of the the Thunder announces, people are like, "What the heck?" But it's because the Thunder used to be the double A or triple A affiliate of Yankees, the yeah. Yankees, but they yeah. are no longer because of minor league restructuring. But, anyways, it's bizarre. Um, just a funny thing to happen this week on the list of bizarre things to happen with the Blue Jays um, and in the world we find ourselves in. The last thing, which maybe we want to discuss a little bit. The Blue Jays are a strong contender to host um, one of the upcoming All-Star games because, of course, we saw the All-Star game moved out of Atlanta, um, but the Major League Baseball is still trying to figure out what's happening in terms of 2023, 2024, 2025, those All-Star games. And um, they are, the Blue Jays are in consideration to host the All-Star game in one of those three years. So we'll see what happens there. We don't know when the uh, <laughs> price and with the 1991 all-star game hat, we don't know when the decision is going to be made, but that's another thing to keep an eye on, which I think would be pretty cool to see the all-star game come back to Toronto after like you just showed, I guess 30 years, it would be 30 plus years since the last all-star game there. I have that hat. Uh, I love that hat. And uh, you know, the festivities are always cool with the all-star game. Um, the one thing I know a lot of people are, you know, iffy about the game, but one thing I've always wanted to attend is a home run derby. So eventually if if that's the case, uh, I'm going. So, I mean, hopefully that's, hopefully they're back in Toronto by then, but (laughs) this year I'm going home run derby in Colorado, Coors field. That's going to be bonkers. I cannot wait for that home run derby. I think is my favorite day of the year. I love it so, so much. Sometimes it falls on my birthday, which just makes it even better. But anyways, I'm thrilled for that. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh, a, a Coors Field, that's going to be, uh, you know, depending on who's going to be, you know, hitting in the Derby, but either way, I mean, everyone can hit home runs now. So that's going to be, there's going to be a lot of uh, balls that are hit very far. So that'll be really cool to see. I'm not sure why, you know, it, when's the last time there was an All-Star game in Colorado? Has there been one? I think there has been. I think there was one in the late 90s. I think it was yeah. like 1998. Or yes. something like that. Per, yeah, so either way, right around the steroid era too back then. So it's, it'll be really <laughs> cool to see it this year especially with how the game's changed but that's the home run derby is always something i circle for sure i think one thing that i'm kind of a little iffy about is in 2016 when the all-star game was in san diego i was actually in san diego during the 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 time of the all-star break and i didn't get to go to the home run derby because it was so expensive so I'm hoping it comes to Toronto soon so I have a bit of revival because, I mean, I haven't been to the Rogers Center since 2018, so I'm itching to get back, first of all. Uh, but I think it will definitely be re- very fun to see all these stars because you know, I'm not just a Blue Jays fan. I'm a baseball fan in general, and that goes to all the sports that I like. So it's definitely – it's a fun time to see uh, your your city get represented. And I, I believe the last All-Star game in Toronto was the NBA, and that was – Uh, that was a very very fun game to watch especially with all the celebrities and drake absolutely losing his mind during that game but it's definitely it's a fun game a fun experience i will say i'm a little not upset but it it does kind of take the fun away the fact that the the actual game the all-star game does not have any meaning on the world series so it's just kind of an exhibition game still fun nonetheless and before people uh before people at me on instagram 
I understand that it's the best decision. And I understand that the, the team hosting the World Series should be the better team. I'm just saying it's, it was a little bit more fun to watch when it was when there was actual meaning behind it. But nonetheless, it's still it's a very fun experience and it's a very fun thing to watch once a year. That was the best dunk contest of all time. When you're talking mm-hmm. about the last NBA one, I just wanted to throw that in there. But yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about that. I mean, I could see both ways. Obviously, everyone, you know, everyone, there's not a lot of effort or motivation behind an all-star game. So it was cool how they threw that in there. But I'm, I think they made the right call of making it the better team. <laughs> but I'm yeah, it, yeah. it never made sense. To have the, <laughs> yeah, having the winning team have, yeah you know, home field advantage. It never made sense. But OK, um, we're going to wrap things up there. It's been a long episode, lots to talk about, but we got a lot in. But before we do that, Jacob, you have a special thing to mention about our podcast and what we're doing i do so yes for the i didn't even realize we've been doing this podcast since 2017 so five years and including this year and so far it's only been on audio streaming services however this week as i'm sure the people watching this probably know now it is now on youtube as well and it's it's i think it's going to be a really fun thing so we this is probably the first piece of content that's on the youtube channel it is the full-length episode and every week i'm now happy to say we are going to be posting full-length podcast episodes on our youtube channel link will be in our bios and in the the podcast description so we're going to be posting full-length episodes there with video which i think will be a very interesting uh if very interesting different take on this episode and and future episodes but also we're going to be going live on that youtube channel quite a bit i think we're going to do some pre-game streams some post-game streams maybe during the streams or during the games, if I'm able to process that for that. Computer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> baby steps, but I gotta, I gotta figure out how to use this computer, but yeah, uh, I think this YouTube channel will be a very fun thing for this, this podcast. So if this is, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like subscribe, uh, turn on post notifications, because as I said, we're going to be share and, and share. Yes. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, and if All you're not cliche. watching it on YouTube, Go check it out on YouTube. It's the YouTube channel is section 138 uh, dot dot a Toronto Blue Jays podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I think this will be this will be the next step. And I'm really excited to to expand this audience to a bigger and hopefully crazier amount of Blue Jays fans, because I love looking in the chat and seeing people on live streams just absolutely go bananas when things happen. So I'm (laughs) very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. (laughs) No, I was going to say I'm very excited. And yeah, please consider checking the channel out on youtube and it'll be basically going forward again full-length episodes every week followed by content throughout the week and i think it'll be a very fun thing for us to do yeah we're uh we're we're youtubers now technically this is uh pretty cool (laughs) yeah i just i love that oh yeah subscribe yeah yeah check it i'll put the uh the link (laughs) to the podcast uh channel in the description of this podcast if you're listening to it and you want to check it out the video of it um and you can see like i don't know me getting made fun of by bryson for you know saying that tanner work deserves another start so that's one thing you can check out we'll look forward to that um in addition to that check out our patreon patreon.com slash section 138 pod follow us on instagram and twitter at section 138 pod um rate and review our podcast on itunes all those good stuff um hopefully we have a winning series against the yankees coming up and we'll be back after that next week but until then We'll catch you next week. Thank you for watching this week's episode of the Section 138 podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below as well as comment your thoughts about what we had to discuss in this episode. If you're new, you can subscribe by clicking the icon in the middle as well as hit that post notification bell so that you're one of the first people to view our videos. Also, be sure to check out our social media pages by clicking the links at the bottom of your screen to keep up to date with everything that we're doing, as well as consider supporting us on Patreon where you'll receive amazing benefits such as an invitation to our Discord server and the ability to influence what is discussed in future videos. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you soon.